بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم السلام علیکم دس از مدیحہ صحیح فرام ڈپارٹمنٹ آف زولوجی یونیورسٹی آف ایجوکیشن بینک روڈ کیمپس لاہور سو اسٹوڈنٹس ٹوڈے وی آر گوائنگ ٹو ٹاک اباؤٹ پروٹو کارڈیٹس لیٹس ہیو فرسٹ دا انٹروڈکشن آف دا پروٹو کارڈیٹس As the name suggests, proto means that something is that is primitive, that is original, that is earliest. So, uh, proto chordates are also known as the lure chordates. These are the those animals that have a rod-like structure that is flexible and that is mostly present at their towards mostly towards their dorsal side. Uh, that rod-like structure is called notochord. So, these animals have the notochords at the certain stage of their lives. these animals are called proto chordates and proto chordates exhibit organ system level organization they have a group of the organs organ system means that they have the group of the organs in their body that work uh, together and perform different functions okay let's uh, classify the proto chordates proto chordates is actually a informal category that houses only few phylums and subphylums uh, because uh, they are the those animals that are prior to the evolution of the uh, exact vertebrate chordates right so proto chordates include two uh, main phylums phylum hemichordates and phylum chordata so in hemichordates uh, today we will be discussing about two main classes class enteroneusta and class terobranchia and in the phylum chordata we'll be discussing two subphylums that comes under the definition of protochordates that are the subphylum urochordata and subphylum cephalochordata otherwise there are also subphylums of uh, uh, phylum chordata including ph- major known uh, phylum that is the subphylum vertebrae which include further classes of aves reptil reptilia even mammals uh, but uh, as our topic is protochordate so we will be focusing today only on these three phylums which comes under the definition of protochord so protochords um, have the phylum hemichordata and the phylum chordata and within the phylum chordata only two subphylums will uh, which we will discuss that is the subphylum urochordata and subphylum cephalochordata all right so these things we are going to discuss today two classes of hemichordata and two subphylums of the chordata because we are discussing protochordates only today okay the first phylum we are going to discuss in protochordates is the phylum hemichordata hemichordata hemi means half so the animals that are included in this phylum show only few of the chordate characteristics that's why they are known as the hemichordates uh if we talk about the characteristics one by one then they are marine animals they are mostly worms acorn worms they are marine animals means they live in the oceanic water they don't live in the fresh water they are deuterostomates and uh, deuterostomates are those organisms in which the blastopore that is present during the embryonic development develops finally into the anus instead of the mouth so in those animals where blastopore develops into the anus are called deuterostomate animals and their body is divided into three regions uh, one is proboscis the first part of the body is called proboscis then collar then trunk same the cilium is also divided into three cavities so cilium is divided into three cavities secondly they have the ciliated pharyngeal slits slits are you know openings these are like clefts so uh, they have actually the gill slits uh, that are perforated in the pharyngeal wall because they are perforated in the pharyngeal walls these are like the gills openings that are joining the digestive system towards the pharynx as well as they open outside of the body that and they have the cilia that's because they are perforated in the uh, pharyngeal wall that's why they are also known as the pharyngeal slits or gill slits and they have the cilia so they are the ciliated pharyngeal slits 
and uh, open circulatory system they don't have the circulatory system in which blood is totally confined into vessels but they have the open circulatory system like do we have the closed circulatory system uh, our blood never ever moves through the tissue spaces it is always confined into vessels into capillaries but in case of hemichordates they have the open circulatory system so their blood moves uh, through the tissue spaces openly uh, next they have the complete digestive tract they have uh, they have they have the proper mouth they have the pharyngeal region they have the intestinal region they have the anus so they have the complete digestive tract they have the nerve cord that is present on the dorsal side dorsal side means the upper side of the worm or the animal they have the notochord but that is a very very primitive type and their notochord is known as the stomochord okay the very first class which we are going to discuss of the phylum hemichordata is the class enteroneusta so the word enteroneusta has been uh, derived from the greek word entero which means intestine intestines and neusta means to respire to breathe so because they have the their gill slits are perforated in the pharyngeal wall that's why and they respire through the water that is being bathed in the gills and exit the body through the gill slits or gill pores so that's why they are known as the entero neust if we talk about their uh, members then acorn worms are their members um they all are marine worms they live in oceans and if you talk about their size then they range in size from 10 to 40 centimeter uh, their usual size is between 10 to 40 centimeter but some acorn worms are as long as 2 meters so uh, if you talk about their species the only 100 species have been described yet let's uh, talk about their habitat where do they live and how do they live acorn worms live in burrows they live in the uh, oceans but they uh, make burrows with the help of their proboscis they dig their burrows with the help of their proboscis in the sandy and muddy substrates of the oceans so they live there and their burrow shape is uh, like the uh, u-shaped letter u their shape burrow shape is like the letter u uh, next about the morphology of the acorn worms uh, if we talk about their body structure then their body structure is divided into three parts one is the proboscis second one is the collar and third one is the trunk proboscis proboscis so this first region this is extensible elongated tube like structure is known as the proboscis then this ring is the collar and the rest of the body is the trunk so as their body is divided into three regions proboscis collar and trunk their uh, silom is also divided into three regions that's why its silom is known as tripartite silom why tripartite because uh, tri means three and partite mean partitions right so their silom is divided into three partitions that's why silom is known as a tripartite silom so this is the very common feature of the hemichordates that they share with the echinoderms so uh, we could say that they have been evolved from the echinoderms echinoderms also have the tripartite silom uh, if you talk about their body surface they have the ciliated epidermis the outermost layer as you know of the skin or the body wall is the epidermis so they have what kind of epidermis they have the ciliated epidermis they have the cilia on their epidermis as well as they have the gland cells that covers the whole body of the acorn worms or enteroneust okay another uh, thing is mouth that is located between the proboscis and the collar here you can see this is the proboscis and this is the collar region and here mouth is located so this part upper part of the worm is known as the dorsal and lower part is known as the ventral so mouth is located towards the ventral side this is the mouth if we talk about the pharyngeal slits then they have the variable number of pharyngeal slits here you can see these are the pharyngeal slits and these are the pharyngeal pouches pouches are like pockets so uh, the number of pharyngeal is varying uh, to few to several hundreds in the acorn worms and they are like positioned laterally here on the trunk this is the 
this is the uh, proboscis region then collar and this rest of the region is the trunk so the you can say that pharyngeal slits are present in the trunk region and they are laterally on sidewise like uh, present and uh, uh, now read it variable numbers of pharyngeal slits from a few to several hundred are positioned laterally on the trunk right uh, pharyngeal slits are openings between the anterior region of the digestive tract uh, called pharynx and, and the outside of the body so where, uh, where the openings or the slits are present they are present on the anterior region of the digestive tract anterior region is uh, where this is the anterior region of digestive tract uh, as we go uh, more uh, here that then the posterior region will be started so pharyngeal slits are present at the anterior regions and they connect where pharynx to the outside of the body Uh, digestive system of the acrine worms as i told you that digestive system of the acrine worm they have the complete digestive system from mouth with gut and uh, and the least the anus so uh, it is a very simple type of digestive system uh, they do have they have the just simple tube and uh, this tube is divided further into the uh, hepatic sacs and uh, pharynx uh, etc so uh, what happened food is digested as the diverticula of the gut um, gut has the pockets diverticula are the uh, pouches of the gut uh, called hepatic sacs uh, these are the hepatic sacs and uh, they release the actually enzyme that digests the food and the worm then extends its posterior end. Uh, the portion that contains the proboscis is known as the anterior end of the worm, and the portion that contains the that have the anus is known as the posterior uh, end of the worm. So they have the posterior end outside of the their burrow. Rest of the body will be buried in the burrow, but for defecation they will. Uh, take out their posterior end out of the burrow and they will uh, their fecal material like castings here you can see in this picture these are the casting this green portion represents the posterior portion of the acrine worm the uh, rest of the body is buried under the burrow uh, but this portion is out of the burrow why because of the for the defecation uh, this is all the waste material of the acrine worm that is known as the in the form of the castings and uh, why this large amount of waste material because they uh, also uh, intake a lot of the mud through their proboscis and through their mouth as well so that's why their excretory material also contains a lot of mud and and they excrete in uh, like the castings okay here comes the nervous system of the acrine worm uh, the nervous system of acrine worms is ectodermal in origin uh, and lies at the base of the ciliated epidermis as i told you in previous slide that their epidermis is covered with the cilia so their uh, nervous system lies just below the epidermis and it is why it is ectodermal in region because uh, ecto uh, during the embryonic development this nervous system is originated from the ectoderm membrane of the embryo so it consists of dorsal and ventral nerve tracts here in this picture you can see this is the ventral nerve tract in blue color and this is the dorsal nerve tract or the trunk nerve cord so this, uh, this is just lie below the the first layer is the epidermis ciliated epidermis and this blue line uh, that you can see here is just lie below the epidermis so the nervous system is just below the epidermis and it is ectodermal in origin it is originated from the ectoderm layer of the embryo and it consists of dorsal the dorsal nerve and the ventral nerve and um, a network of epidermis cells also present uh, form the nerve plexus plexus means network so what do they have in the nervous system their nervous system is ectodermal in origin and they have the dorsal nerve cord they have the ventral nerve cord and uh, dorsal nerve cord is also known as, as the uh, trunk nerve cord and uh, besides these two nerve cords they have the epidermal cells that form the network on the whole epidermis of the nerve network all right then gas exchange so uh, gas exchange is mainly done by the diffusion 
in addition to diffusion through body wall respiratory gases are exchanged at the pharyngeal slits what happen water enters from the mouth into the acrion worm and then they circulate and then uh, gases are get exchanged and they uh, then the water exits the body of the acrion worm through the pharyngeal slits okay here you can see the pharyngeal slits water enters through mouth it circulates in this area gas uh, exchange will be done here and then the water exits from the these gill slits or the pharyngeal slits next is about the circulatory system this circulatory system consists of again here you can see consists of dorsal ventral vessel one when this is the ventral side of the worm this is the dorsal side of the worm you know that the upper side is known as the dorsal side and lower side is known as the ventral side in our case our front is the ventral and our back side is the dorsal yes we are talking about right now the circulatory system of acrine worm their circulatory system consists of two major vessels here you can see in red this is the ventral vessel and this is the dorsal blood vessel this one this one is the dorsal blood vessel now you can see uh, here you can see the heart right in the anterior of the worm so you can say that blood uh, is distributed to the anterior region through the dorsal vessel and to the posterior region through the ventral vessel means the front of the acrine worm will be uh, uh, provided by the blood through dorsal blood vessel and back of the or tail region or anus region of the uh, worm will be provided by the blood through ventral blood vessel uh, now talk about the reproduction and development of the anterior nuce or the acrine worm uh, well acrine worms are dioecious dime in two right so the both male and female organs will be present in two different two different worms two different individuals they have the two rows of gonads that are present in the anterior region of the trunk anterior region as i told you in the previous slide the front region is known as the anterior region that has the proboscis and the collar and just behind the collar is the trunk anterior region so gonads in two rows are present in that region fertilization is always external when one worm uh, spawn in the area or one worm lays egg in the area then it induces the other worms in the surrounding area to spawn the sperms there all right uh, then uh, after the fertilization uh, a ciliated larva the larva that is covered with cilia will be produced and its name is special that is the tornaria larva acrimonds larva is known as the tornaria its shape is like this this is the tornaria larva okay it swims plankton for several several days uh, planktons are the doors organism if you talk about the larva then it swims like a plankton means that it floats in the water and to few days to the weeks and finally what happened this uh, tornaria will settle on a substrate and gradually it will be developed into the adult acron worm Second class of phylum Hemichordata is the class Terobranchia. So this class is very very small class, and like all other Hemichordates, they all are marine and they live in the deep oceanic waters of southern hemisphere. Um, because this is a very small class, only few species are known. Only 20 species are known, and uh, they are not small only in case of their number of species but they are also small um, if you talk about their size because they range in size from only 0.1 to 5 millimeter as we as if we compare their size with the uh, anterior news then they were about 10 to uh, 40 centimeters and even uh, 2 meters but they are very small they are just 0.1 to 5 millimeter anterior news live in burrows that they dug by themselves with the help of their proboscis but in case of terobranchia they live in the tubes that they uh, secreted by that they uh, secrete by themselves and in their in their tubes they uh, produced asexual colonies so they live uh, they made their homes by themselves and their home is their tubes and uh, they are filter feeders 
filter feeders means what that when uh, water baths through their gills the food particles are trapped uh, and the rest of the water exit the body so they are filter feeders they filters the food particles through the water uh, and gas exchange is done by the diffusion diffusion you know that it is the uh, movement of the molecules or substance from higher concentration to the lower concentration so they are as small they are very small animals they don't need um, uh, some extraordinary excretory structures or respiratory structures uh, gas exchange and even waste exchange is done only and only by diffusion now the morphology of the anterior news sorry the morphology of the therobranchs yes um Therobranchs are, as I told, that uh, they live in the tubes that they secrete themselves. Here you can see that they, their body is also divided into three parts. First is the proboscis. This proboscis is shield-like. This is not the extensible organ. This is the shield-like proboscis, and it secretes. This proboscis secretes the tubes. These yellow, you can see, these are the tubes. All right, and inside the tube, this is the body of the therobranch. they have the u shaped trunk the trunk is like u shaped they have the uh, uh, first part of the body is the proboscis but proboscis is not the conical structure but it is shield like all right and then uh, behind the proboscis is the uh, second part of their body that is the collar and uh, collar has the arms uh, even they have the 2 to 9 arms here two arms are only visible one is this and the other one is this and their arms have the ciliated tentacles these are the tentacles they are called ciliated tentacles because they are the tentacles but they are uh, very much in number that's why they are known as the ciliated tentacles so and their trunk is u shaped their proboscis helps them in secreting the tubes and the same proboscis helps them to move within the tube now the reproduction and development of the therobranchs Uh, as i told you uh, uh, previously that uh, they uh, reproduce asexually also by the uh, um, and form the colonies that uh, and they live in the tubes but uh, their asexual reproduction is responsible for making the colony but they do also do the sexual reproduction they are dioecious uh, sexes are separate in separate individuals and fertilization is external by the fertilization a larva planula like larva forms and this larva uh, lives in the tube of the female now as i told you that fertilization is external so here i am talking about the tube of the female okay i am not talking about the body of the female therobranch so the larva uh, lives in the tube of the female the tube that is secreted by the worm itself all right so and after a, a few days few time this the larva remains non feeding it does not feed at that time when it is living in the tube so after some time this larva uh, exit from the female's tube and it outside the tube it settles to some substrate and form a cocoon cocoon is uh, is what uh, they form a protective uh, silky uh, case around themselves the larva form for the protection this is what is known as the cocoon and formally uh, and finally it uh, will be developed into the adult after metamorphosis so this was all about the hemi phylum hemichordata we discussed about two classes of hemichordata one was the anterior neusta and the other one was the tero branchs next phylum that we are going to discuss is the phylum chordata but as we are uh, today our topic of discussion is protochordates so we will discuss only those sub phylum of the phylum chordata that have the protochordates uh, characteristics uh if we talk about the phylum chordata then this phylum includes around 45000 species and it includes all many large animals and some animals of them are very economic uh, importance have many economic uh, economic importance so phylum uh, chordata includes most highly evolved animals as we know that we humans are also belongs to phylum chordata but its class vertebrae 
the vertebrates as well as the marine invertebrates, cephalochordates and urochordates, that is amphioxus and the tunicates. This is what we will discuss in our later slides. Uh, so uh, we will be discussing only two subphylum of the phylum chordata, that is the invertebrate file, uh, subphylum cephalochordata and the urochordates. Okay, students, this is the classification of chordates. Uh, here I have given the classification just to make the picture clear that what we are going to discuss and what we are not going to discuss. Here if you see that chordates have been divided into tunicates, lancelets, hackfishes, lampreys, sharks, bony fishes, amphibians, reptiles, birds and mammals. Uh, these all are known as this chordata. They all belong to the, uh, uh, they all belong to the phylum chordata in which after hackfishes these all the subphylum vertebrata these subphylum vertebrata belongs to the group craniata uh, craniata means the uh, animals that have the proper cranium or the brain box but uh, our focus would be these two subphylums urochordata and cephalochordata why because they belong to the chordata but they are the protochordates and they also known as the A craniata because they lack the cranium or they lack the proper skull or brain box. So our focus will be urochordates and cephalochordates today. Okay, these are the fundamental characteristics that are present in the chordates. Uh, now, what are these? First of all, notochord. As I told you, the notochord is a flexible rod-like uh, structure. Uh, that is mostly present at the dorsal towards more towards the dorsal side uh, this is very very fundamental characteristic that should be present in the chordates as well as in the protochordates uh, second is the nerve cord again this is a hollow tube fuel filled tubes that run along the length of the animal pharyngeal gill slits these what we talked already in our previous slides that these are the slit slits means openings that are present in the gills and are also perforate or also forms the opening in the pharyngeal wall that's why they are known as the pharyngeal gill slits we can also call them gill slits we can also call them pharyngeal slits all right anal tail anal tail is one of the most fundamental characteristic of the chordates tail is present at the anal site bilateral symmetrical they are uh, chordates are bilateral symmetrical they have the bilateral symmetry bi means two and lateral means sides so the bilateral symmetry is that symmetry in which we can divide the body into two equal parts right from anterior to posterior so two parts are exactly same that are the like mirror images of each other so such kind of symmetry is known as the bilateral symmetry deuterostomate animals all chordates are deuterostomate animals because the uh, blastopore of the embryo develops eventually into the anus endostylothyroid gland endostyl is an organ that is present in the pharyngeal region and that helps in the filter feeding and ventral contractile blood vessels or heart on the ventral side they have the heart complete digestive system is present here you can see this is the post anal tail all right post anal tail means the post after uh, this tail is present after the anus these are the pharyngeal slits these are also called gill slits these are also called pharyngeal gill slits this is the nerve cord whole dorsal hollow nerve cord hollow means only it has a fluid it, it's like empty and this is the notochord a flexible cartilaginous rod is known as the notochord so these all are the fundamental characteristics of the chordate okay let's talk about the fates of the notochord uh, fates mean destiny of the notochord that notochord eventually develops into which uh, structure either it got disappeared or it will develop into something else so let's read the notochord uh, first is the definition of the notochord exact the notochord is an elongated flexible cartilaginous rod like skeletal structure that lies dorsal to the gut tube and ventral to the nerve cord if you remember the previous slide first uh, is present the nerve cord 
then under the nerve cord is present the uh, notochord so we could say that uh, uh, first nerve cord so on the ventral side of the nerve cord is the notochord and if we uh, talk about the gut then it present on the surface of the gut it is present on the upper side of the gut so we could say that the notochord present dorsal to the gut and ventral to the nerve cord all right in most adult chordates the notochord disappears uh, or becomes highly modified or it is surrounded and replaced by a vertebral column so uh, these uh, this what uh, it is here we talked about the uh, more advanced chordates like humans uh, you can uh, feel the vertebral column you know that we have the vertebral column the notochord eventually uh, develop into a proper vertebral column in higher chordates like humans in some non vertebrate chordates and fishes the notochord persist as a laterally flexible but compressible skeletal rod in case of the higher vertebrates it develops into a uh, modified and special vertebral column okay but in case of the lower chordates or non vertebrate chordates uh, they are the chordates because they have the chordate characteristics they have the pharyngeal slits they have the postanal tail and they have the rest of their chordate uh, characteristics they have the notochord but notochord will not develop into the vertebral column instead it persists and it is flexible but it is not compressible we cannot compress it okay in some species it differentiates in embryo, uh, embryogenic into the brain anteriorly and spinal cord that runs through the trunk and the tail together the brain and the spinal cord the central nervous system so what happened here that uh, uh, in many species uh, it develops into the brain and it develops into the spinal cord and these two things brain that is uh, uh, in the skull in the cranium uh, and the spinal cord that runs along the vertebral column right so uh, both collectively known makes the system that is known as the central nervous system okay the phylum we are going to discuss uh, is the subphylum urochordata this is the subphylum of the phylum chordata uh, urochordates have the notochord but that notochord extends just behind the head and uh, approaches the tail uh, all members of the subphylum urochordata are known as the tunicates uh, this subphylum is divided into many classes mainly three classes ascidians and uh, mainly three classes like here you can see ascidians appendicularians appendicularians also known as the larvations and Thaliations, but the major class is Ascidians, and that is comprised of the tunicates. The word tunicate, why? Because they have the sac-like covering, or they have the tunic. That's why they are called tunicates. Here you can see here. This is the adult tunicates, and that are covered by a sac or a tunic. That's why they are known as the tunicates. And this tunic is composed of a material that is known as the tunicine. Tunicine is somewhat like the cellulose. Cellulose, you know, it is what it is the polysaccharide. So, adult tunicates are sessile. Uh, they don't move much, but they remain attached themselves to the substrates, and they can live in the form of colonies as well as they can live alone or solitary. And they are mostly appendicularians and thalassians uh, are mostly planktonic. As adults uh, means they uh, are filter feeders right and they feed by filtering the water uh, sessile urochordates attach their sac like bodies to the rocks and because their bodies are like sac like and this sac is called the tunic and they attach their bodies to the rocks or pilings and uh, any other hard or solid substrates Okay, here's the anatomy of the organ system. The unattached end of the urochordates contains two siphons that permit seawater to circulate through them. Here you can see uh, that uh, this portion, this is the lower portion, this portion is attached to the substrate, and this is the free portion. This has the two siphons. 
One is the incurrent siphon and this is known as the excurrent siphon. What happens? The water enters through the incurrent siphon. It circulates through the body where gas exchange and filter feeding is done. And then finally exit, exit through the excurrent siphon. So one siphon that is the inlet for water. This is also known as the oral siphon. We call it the oral siphon and uh, the second siphon this siphon is known as the excrete siphon as well as arterial siphon this atrial siphon and this is the oral siphon now let's read it one siphon is the oral siphon which is the inlet for the water circulating through the body and is usually directly opposite to the attached end of the acidians it also serves as a mouth opening here you can see that this is the attached end and it is directly opposite to the attached end so, uh, what is directly opposite to the attachment? The inlet uh, siphon, incurrent siphon, or the oral siphon. These three names could you can you could give to this opening. And the second siphon, the atrial siphon, is the opening for the excurrent water. Okay, if we talk about the body wall of the tunicates, then um, already we have read about the tunic. So, the body wall uh, is, um, uh, first we talk about the tunic. The outermost layer is the sac, that is the tunic, and that is of connective tissue, uh, basically. Connective tissue like covering, and uh, it appears, it has a gel-like or jelly-like appearance, but it is very tough. It's not, uh, it is mucus-like. It is jelly-like, it is flexible, but at the same time, it is the it is tough uh, covering and um, this covering is actually secreted by the epidermis of the body wall epidermis you know the outermost layer of the body wall or the skin is called epidermis right so this epidermis actually secretes the tunic of the tunicates it is composed of cellulose and various salts and the proteins. And now this tunic not only have the proteins and various salts, but this tunic also have the blood vessels and blood cells. Alright, now these blood cell vessels and blood cells are actually derived from mesoderm layer. Uh, you already know, I think, about uh, the three germ layers, uh, ectoderm, endoderm and mesoderm. These are three germ layers. These are three embryonic layers. So, mesoderm is present between the ectoderm and endoderm. So, these cells or the, uh, the these blood vessels and blood cells that are incorporated into the tunic or the gel-like outer sac of the tunicates is der are derived from the mesoderm. Um, body wall also contains both longitudinal cells, elongated cells, and as well as the circular cells. And these cells are uh, help the tunicate to change their shape. Longitudinal and circular muscles below the body wall uh, epithelium help to change the shape of the adult tunicate. Okay, now the nervous system of urochordates. A uh, nervous system is mostly confined or attached to the body wall of the urochordates. Again, nervous system is the form of the network of the nerves nerve plexus all right but only with a single ganglion now what is the location of that ganglion in previous slide we have talked about the two siphons uh, so the location of the uh, ganglion is between the oral and the atrial siphon i will show you in the uh, later slides uh, well uh, this ganglion ganglion is what ganglion is the collection of the nerve cells especially the nerve bodies nerve cell bodies all right so uh, they have a single ganglion but this ganglion is uh, has no role in body coordination um, but body body is coordinated by many nerve cells many receptors that are present for the chemical as well as for the mechanical stimuli uh, so these receptors help them to sense the chemical any uh, kind of chemical stimulus around them and the response uh, respond to that stimulus as well as they these receptors help them to respond to, for the mechanical stimulus mechanical stimulus is a stimulus uh, that could be the touch stimulus that could be the change in the pressure in the surrounding that could be the waves of the water pressure of the waves of the water uh, that could be the turbulence of the water so these all are the mechanical stimuli so the receptors are present all over their body wall 
uh, especially around the siphons all right so tunicates are more coordinated through their receptors rather than their only single ganglion this is what about the nervous system of the tunicates okay atrium here we uh, study atrium okay, first let me show you the ganglion this is the incurrent oral siphon this is the atrial siphon and this what here it is located the nerve ganglion the only one nerve ganglion they have all right okay atrium the most obvious internal structure of the urocorder is a very large pharynx and a cavity this very large cavity is known as the atrium this is this is this is all uh, dark peach color shows the uh, largest cavity that is known as the atrium and atrium surrounds the pharynx laterally and dorsally on both sides of the pharynx uh, a cavity pharynx is surrounded by a cavity and that cavity is known as the atrium the pharynx of tunicates originates at the oral siphon and is continuous with the remainder of the digestive tract here you can see the pharynx uh, which is located to the oral siphon Here, this is the endostyle. Endostyle is the organ uh, that helps in the filter feeding. This what all the phary pharyngeal region, and it is uh, covered with the cavity that is known as the atrium. The oral margin of the pharynx has a tentacle that prevents large objects from entering the pharynx. Okay, the oral margin near the oral siphon, the pharynx has the tentacles, which is not shown right now in the picture. Uh, what is the function of that tentacles that tentacle stops or prevent large object from entering the pharyngeal region okay now the digestive system of urocordates uh, urocordates have the complete digestive system that starts from the mouth then pharynx and finally ends up at the anus that is present near the atrial or excurrent siphon uh, so what happened here water enters as they are the filter feeder so water enters through the oral siphon or the mouth um, into the pharyngeal region no pharyngeal region has an endostyle organ that helps uh, in the filter feeding how because a endostyle is like a furrow or it is a narrow path like structure uh, it secretes mucus and uh, mucus is you know that it is what it is the uh, liquid with thick consistency or you can say jelly like material so when water passes through the endostyle the food particles are get trapped into the mucus that is secreted by the endostyle so these food particles brought into the oral siphon with incurrent water are trapped in the mucus sheath and pass dorsally got it now now what happened then the water moves from here in the pharyngeal region gas exchange is also done right uh, from here then through the stomach and then finally all the food particles and then finally the waste product will be uh, excreted out through anus ultimately through the excurrent siphon to the out of the body in addition to its role in feeding the pharynx also function in gas exchange gases are exchanged as, as water circulates through the tunicates now the circulatory system of the urocordates or tunicates uh, well their heart lies just at the base of the pharynx and uh, one vessel from the heart gives the blood anterior this is the anterior portion of the tunicate and this is the posterior so one vessel from the heart give the blood to the anterior uh, portion to the endostyle and pharynx and other to the posterior portion to the rest of the digestive system two vessels are there here if uh, here you can see this is the heart that is present at the base of this is the heart that is present at the base of the pharynx so it has the two vessels uh, now this heart uh, beats but uh, it uh, because of its contractions uh, blood uh, blood will not flow in one direction so blood will flow or for few beats blood blood, uh, blood will flow in one direction and for the few beats its direction will be reversed so we can say that the blood flow through the heart is not unidirectional not in the one direction okay now on the reproduction and development of the urocordates 
uh, urochordates are monoecious. Uh, both sex organs are present in the same organism. But cross fertilization is the rule. In, except in some species. In some species, there is a self fertilization, but in most of the species, cross fertilization does occur. Uh, as you know, that cross fertilization means that the female gametes will uh, fuse up with the male gametes of the other organism. But in case of self fertilization, both gametes will be provided by the same organism. Uh, so, what happened here that uh, for the external fertilization, as major rule is external fertilization so gametes will be exited through the body uh, exited uh, from the body through the atrial siphon or the excrement siphon but for the self in case of self fertilization X may be retained in the atrium for fertilization and the early development. So in this picture you can see easily this is the metamorphosis of the urochordates. This is a, a free swimming larva and it has the notochord here in the tail right so uh, that's why they are known be, uh, that's why they are known as the urochordates tailed uh, notochord and this is the uh, earlier larva uh, no notochord is getting reduced this is the late morph metamorphosis and this is the degenerating notochord here uh, you can easily um, see that or easily observe that the uh, larva has uh, changed its direction now it is at this direction all right this is the oral and this is the atrial siphon finally adult should be like this okay this is all the detail of the metamorphosis uh, tunicates as uh, you uh, saw in the previous picture that they start their life as a free living larva uh, at the start the larva is free living and uh, it is uh, its shape is like a tadpole um, it has uh, it exhibit the chordate characters and it contains the nerve cord it has the short notochord in its tail only so metamorphosis begins after a brief free appearing larva existence and then the larva does not feed uh, during the free uh, living stage larva does not feed but at later stages um, it reach its maturity and it attaches itself to the bottom of the sea and undergoes to the retrogressive metamorphosing and it uh, loses its tail and most of the chordate characteristics uh, most of the chordate characteristics will be disappeared from the tunicates but only the uh, single characteristic uh, that left is the gill slits and later uh, it develops into a bear like and usually sedentary adult form Sedentary adult form is like uh, that attached remain attached to the substrate that does not uh, move too much This is the sedentary form or sedentary way of life Okay, and other subphylum of the phylum chordata that is included in protocols is the subphylum cephalochordata uh, So their name suggests as cephalo mean head so they have the a notochord that extends from head up to the tail uh, their notochord persists throughout their life and their nerve cord also extends from the head up to the tail and the common uh, members of this subphylum are the lancelets and uh, they are very lean thin eel like animals and they used to spend their most of the time while being buried in the sand but uh, where do they are present they are present throughout the world's ocean but they don't prefer the deep ocean water but uh, they do prefer the shallow water uh, with clean sand substrates if you talk about the major genera of the cephalocords then there are two basic genera branchiostoma and ace metron uh, branchiostoma also known as amphioxus lancelets are all known as the amphioxus because they have the both tapered and pointed ends and that's why this name is given to them uh, only 45 species of this subphylum are known yet now structure and anatomy of cephalochordates cephalochordates have you have seen uh, in previous slide in the picture that they are elongated and literally flattened organisms if you talk about their size then they are uh, five centimeter long approximately uh, in spite of their streamlined shape and 
because of their shape they should be very fast swimmer but they are very weak swimmers and they like to spend their most of the time um, in a filter feeding position so in this way they partly buried themselves but their interior portion uh, is always sticking out of the sand because they are filter feeders so they take in water by the interior portion or mouth that the uh, rest of the body uh, will be buried in the soil but or in the sand but the interior end will be out of the sand so uh, but unlike other chordates um, notochord is consist of muscle cells because of the muscle cells notochord uh, shows somewhat uh, contractions uh, in the uh, in the rod so the contraction of the these muscles are increase the rigidity what happened with the rigidity they uh, can uh, push in them into the soil substrate because of the muscle cells of the notochord uh, they got the rigidity in their body and because of this rigidity they could uh, push themselves into the soil uh, relaxes uh, at the same time when these muscle cells of the notochord got relaxed uh, it will help them for the swimming though they are the weak swimmer but they do swimming a little, a little bit here you can see the lancelet anatomy mm. now this is the mouth right and this is the exit portion uh, this is known as atriopore in case of uh, urochordates the exit portion uh, was the atrial siphon but here it is known as the atriopore these are the pharyngeal gill slits atrium cavity is known as the atrium this is the anus and this in yellow color this is the notochord uh, no in yellow color this is the hollow nerve cord and the ventral to the nerve cord is what notochord so we can say that notochord is present dorsal to the gut or the digestive system and ventral to the nerve cord right these are the tentacles that uh, stops of course the major or big objects from being entering into the mouth okay now the digestive system digestive tract is complete pharynx is large as we see uh, that pharynx is very large elongated kind of pharynx is there and uh, it has the numerous pharyngeal slits or the gill slits as you know they are filter feeders so what happened water enter into the, their mouth uh, driven by the cilia cilia help uh, or cilia facilitate the um, cephalocordates to take in the water into the buccal cavity and then water uh, moves through the passes through the numerous pharyngeal slits where food is trapped in the mucus okay so when uh, which is then moved to uh, by the cilia into the intestine first water enters uh, through the mouth with the help of the cilia then it passes through uh, the whole digestive system and uh, through the pharyngeal slits and uh, from where the food particles and then move to the intestine for further digestion digestive enzymes secreted by the hepatic cecum there are the uh, pouches of uh, the intestines that are known as the hepatic cecum and filter water finally leaves the body through atriopore as i told you in the previous slide that exit of pore of the uh, cephalocordates is known as the atriopore cephalocords don't have special organ for respiration they they just respire through their general body surface and uh, for excretion they have the paired nephridia uh, you know that nephridia uh, plays the same role as the kidney plays role in vertebrates uh, it removes the waste material from the body uh, circulatory system cephalocordates do not possess a true heart but they have the two major vessels one is called the dorsal aorta that is present at the dorsal side of the um, cephalocordates and other is called the ventral aorta this these two are the major vessels present dorsal and ventral side respectively uh, blood bar bars the tissue spaces because they have the open circulatory system they don't have the closed circulatory system so blood definitely will flow through the tissue spaces their blood lack erythrocytes and uh, their blood lack hemoglobin you know that hemoglobin that carries the oxygen uh, so the blood do what blood just 
transport the nutrients it has no role in the gas exchange of the cephalocaudates okay reproduction uh, cephalocaudates are dioecious means hermaphrodite uh, both sex organs male and female are present in different individuals in separate individuals um, so sex cells or gametes are set free in the atrial cavity and they pass out of the body through the atriopore fertilization is external and that leads to bilateral symmetrical larva now what is bilateral i told you that first they have the larva that is asymmetrical larva but finally it metamorphose uh, metamorphose into a bilateral uh, symmetrical larva the bilateral symmetry uh, is that symmetry in which you can uh, divide the body into two equal halves or the uh, two halves of the body are the mirror images of each other so larva are free swimmer but they eventually settle to the substrate and before metamorphosing into the adult they uh, attach themselves to the some kind of the substrate a life cycle uh, of uh, you can say of the cephalocaudates here uh, you can easily say you can easily see that uh, okay here fertilization occurs this is the fertilized egg first ciliated neurola formed and it takes uh, several hours neurola you know it is an embryo uh, at the neurula stage where the neural tube forms and then it becomes the elongated ciliated neurula and finally asymmetric larva as i told you these all black hairs are the cilia the, it has the mouth and uh, this larva then after several months will be uh, converting to the metamorphic larva and uh, it will have the bilateral symmetry and from this to the adult stage it will take around one year this is the female and this is the male cephalocaudate or lancelets all right this was all about the reproduction of the lancelets well uh, students this was all about uh, the protocordates so we talked about the protocordates and three phylums one that are included in the protocordates one is the phylum hemicordata then we talked uh, we, in that we talked about the two classes of hemicordata then we uh, talked about the phylum cordata and in phylum cordata we discussed two uh, subphylums the phylum urocordata and phylum cephalocordata because phylum urocordata and phylum cephalocordata are the protocordates including uh, these three hemicordata cephalocordata and urocordata these three are the primitive uh, chordates or you would say that they are the lower chordates thank you so much students have a nice day allah hafiz